Hello, I'm Joyce Landry, and this is the Future of Cruising Sustainable Ships series number six, where we are focusing on, I have to say, my favorite destination ever. It's a once in a lifetime experience. It's an opportunity to get so close to nature, and it's called the Galapagos Islands. With me today are Dr. Ellen Prager and Susan Romano, representing Celebrity Cruises, to tell us why we should care about this fragile ecosystem and how, as visitors, we can ensure their sustainability by endorsing programs in the Galapagos and visiting them. We will be speaking with Dr. Prager first about the flora and fauna, followed by Susanna, who will introduce us to Celebrity Cruises sustainable practices in the islands. And she's gonna also show us her brand new vessel built for the Galapagos Celebrity Flora. So now I'm gonna to talk to a little bit about the, um, the technology that we have here. For those who have been with us before, you can see that there's a chat feature on the right-hand side. You can minimize that by just hitting the little button on the upper right-hand side. And when you're ready to ask a question, don't put the question in the chat feature. Put it in the question box, which is at the lower middle part of your screen. And then we'll get to the questions and answers toward the end. So what we're gonna do first is bring our guests on one at a time and they will do their presentation, talk to us about the, um, the Galapagos, and at the very end, we'll all be together to do a question and answer. Dr. Ellen Prager is a marine scientist and author widely recognized for her ability to make science entertaining and understandable. She was chosen by Celebrity Cruises to be their science advisor in the Galapagos Islands and has been working with celebrities since they introduced cruising in the region. Dr. Prager's bio is so vast, it was very hard to pick what to talk about. But something that caught my eye is that it includes that she was the chief scientist for the Aquarius Reef Base Program in Key Largo. She wrote an adventure novel for middle graders called Escape Galapagos. And her previous book, The Shark Whisperer, was called An Underwater Harry Potter. Let's welcome Dr. Prager. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thanks so much, Joyce. That's great. Yeah, yeah you're that's welcome. And it's okay with you. I can call you Ellen so we can please. be on a first name oh, basis. Please do. Yeah. Okay, super. Uh, well, really, I we're excited. We're honored to have you with us. And the first question I'd like to ask is, you know, how did you become science advisor for Celebrity Cruises? How did that happen? Well, I mean, uh, that's kind of almost a teaser question. Because that comes, I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about that in my little presentation. So I don't want to give it away yet. Okay. All right. Great. Well, why don't we get right to it? Because okay. we have a lot to cover today. So, you know, we're really here to discuss sustainability in the Galapagos. And as the expert on the science side, uh, we need to know first, what is it that we're protecting? What is it that we need to be mindful about? So um, let's get together with your slides right now and start with the first one. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for putting them up there. Um, you know, the globe, everybody always talks about the animals, but it's more than the animals. It's the landscapes. It's the rocks, even. It is a, it's the Galapagos are volcanic in origin, and if you're really lucky, you might even get to see something like this. But next slide. Let me, let me answer your question, Joyce. Um, so I actually went to the Galapagos in the 1980s with a research team to study the impact of El Nino on corals. I spent about two and a half months there, and that was in the 1980s, and it was nothing like it is today. We were, there were no, there was one hotel on the island, there was no charter boats, and we spent all day diving and in cold water, and the only showers we had were cold and smelled like sulfur. There were big spiders on our ceilings in the evenings. <laughs> Food was sort of mysterious and questionable. Our equipment failed, and we had some unexpected problems, something when you're in the field, you try and plan for these things. Next slide. And that was sea lions. <laughs> it loved our equipment. It was the funniest. It was the best problem I've ever had. They actually used to try and take our survey gear. And one of their favorite tricks, which it still is next. If you just uh, click this, you'll see what their favorite tricks is. They swim right up to you right there and they blow bubbles in your face. It's Again, one of the best problems I've ever had while doing research. Can, can I just say, Ellen, that my trip to the Galapagos, this is exactly what happened. It's not a one-off for scientists right. type of an experience. I was underwater and I had my mask on and he came right up to my mask and blew bubbles at me. Uh, <laughs> yep, yep. It's, it's they, they love the, the young pups and the young females are very playful and curious. So mm -hmm. 
So next slide. So from that and the relationship I had with Royal Caribbean and Celebrity, um, I developed this position of science advisor. When Celebrity was deciding to bring a ship down there, I went with them to look at, determine what the program should be, what the standards needed to be. We talked about all of that before Celebrity went in. And I will say one of the reasons I came on board with Celebrity was because they were committed to a minimal environmental impact and making it as sustainable as possible. And they've won a lot of environmental awards for that. So I developed this relationship and I'm very proud to say that I'm, I'm working with them, continue to work with them I'm in the islands. And so now let me, let me tell you a little bit why it's so special. I like to say it's a place where we have strange neighbors. Uh, when you're snorkeling, you're snorkeling and you see warm water creatures like sea turtles and tropical fish and even white tip sharks. And then the next thing you know, you just click on it, a penguin swims by. And so very unusual mix of animals in the Galapagos, these warm and cold water creatures. Next slide, but it's not just the mix of animals. The other thing is that they're acclimated to humans. They're so well protected that you can get very close to the animals and they don't run away. You can't get any closer than six feet. Those are the rules. But as you see in these pictures, you don't need a long lens to get a great close-up. You know, if I could add, um, I had gone to the Galapagos right after coming off of an African safari. And I could not believe how much how much time I spent trying to capture animals on safari with all of my lenses. And all I had to do in the Galapagos is just walk around and look down and look up. And they were at eye level, uh, yep. living their own lives and being very natural in front That's of us. Right. That's right. And that, you know, in addition to this unique mix of animals and the unique animals that are there, this access and the fact that they don't run away or swim away is very special. In fact, next slide, you'll see not only do you get to see animals, oftentimes they will raise their chicks. The birds will raise their chicks right in or near the trail. And so you can also see that's a frigate chick in the upper left, the gull chick in the upper right, and of course, one of my favorites, it's a little penguin chick. <laughs> They say it was really funny. I was giving a talk to some kids one day, and somebody, one of the kids in the audience, yelled out, "It has a, the, the penguin has an afro." <laughs> it, was <so laughs> it was so cute. Uh, next slide. Um, and of course, one of everybody's favorites is the blue-footed booby. And so not only do you get to see the animals, but you also get to see their unusual behaviors because again, they're not afraid. So if in the next slide, it should video should come up. And this is one of this is the magical blue-footed booby dance, because it turns out the blue feet are essentially a clue to the health of the bird, and so the males and the females want to show off their blue feet, and that's the saying: "I should be your mate because I have the healthiest feet, the bluest feet, the bright." And so they do a mating dance where they're actually showing off their feet, because again, those feet it turns out are sort of a measure of health or their you know, genetic, genetic strength even. So the blue footed boobies always dance is always one of our favorites. And you know, to my utter amazement, um, they actually made it in front of us as well. Now I've never <laughs> seen that before because usually animals don't do that in front of humans and they were just un, like unperturbed. <laughs> yeah, yep, that's right. Well, this one is one of my favorites. This one, the waved albatross, um, in fact, the naturalists have to tell they have to make me leave when we see this. Next slide. This is the courtship ritual of the waved albatross. And it is one of the funniest things you'll see. They click their bills like they're sword fighting and they bow to each other and then they stand up with their bills wide open. It and you see we had there's numerous pairs doing it right beside each other here. It's incredible. Um, and again, they're not they're not changing their behavior. We were standing very close. This was actually recorded on my iPhone. That's how close we were. Mm -hmm. Next one. Um, some of the species are found in the Galapagos are not found anywhere else in the world. Um, this is what's called a flightless cormorant. Um, I live in Florida and we have cormorants that fly, but in the Galapagos, it's the only place in the world where they, over time, they've lost the ability to fly. You can see in that picture, it wings kind of look, they're very modified and what happened is when they, the cormorants arrived in the Galapagos, there was so much food, there was no competition, no predators, 
They didn't need to fly from island to island, so over time they lost that ability. And what you saw in the water, that was their courtship dance. They do their, their mating dance in the water. So very unique uh, species to the Galapagos. Next slide. Amazing. And one of the things I love about the Galapagos is you never know what you're going to see between their behaviors and what the animals might do. And this is a place called Elizabeth Bay. And I'm here with a group on a inflatable. Um, it's the only thing you can do. It's a secluded lagoon, mangrove lagoon. And the only thing you're allowed to do there is take a ride. And so we're sitting there, the propeller's off, and the sea lion comes by. We had never seen a sea lion do this. Um, and there's water that cools the engine. It's salt water, so it's not fresh water. But it turns out this one just loves the feel of water on its whiskers. Look at this. It's so cute. It's not drinking or drink the water, but their muzzle is very sensitive. And so they love the feeling of the water jet on them and so we just sat there i don't know how long we sat there watching this we were, it were all enthralled it was so much fun but again you never know what you're going to see sort of the unexpected is the normal in the galapagos and you know they're so incredibly curious um you know one of my favorite experiences was snorkeling in an area and there were sea lions on the rocks when they saw us they just slid into the water yeah we didn't know where they went we looked down and all of a sudden they were underneath us and they started to challenge us to play so we started diving down and we were kind of doing circles around each other oh yeah, like, yeah. rolling around each other and we didn't touch them but they were just with us they just wanted to be around us it was really oh, yeah. great it's wonderful where you have an animal that will come and interact with you without trying to feed it or do anything. It's very mm -hmm. natural. Um, so anyway, so let me let me continue for a few more a few more creatures here. This is another unique animal to the Galapagos, which we love seeing. These are marine iguanas, the only one in the world, and they dive into the ocean to feed on algae, and then during the day they warm up on the rocks. And one of the I think the most unusual things you can see anywhere in the world underwater is a marine iguana eating algae. And it's one of the things we look for when we're snorkeling because it kind of looks like a dinosaur. They're very primitive and it's, you know, it just doesn't look right when you see them underwater. So there's tons of them. And you know, there are some animals in the, in the Galapagos that you're saying, well, you might see. There's also some that you say, I guarantee you will see. And this is one. Next one. Next slide. Sometimes what you see is almost unbelievable. In fact, the picture on your left is a blue-footed booby sitting on a marine iguana. And when <laughs> the naturalist on board the celebrity ship took this image and brought it to us, we thought he had photoshopped it. We were like, there's no way that's real. That can't be real. It's truly a blue-footed booby sitting on a marine iguana. Amazing. And then the other slide is uh, was actually a, a shot taken by one of our guests on board celebrity ship. Um, you can see the island in the background is San Cristobal, and there's a very beautiful formation in front of it called Kicker Rock. But behind it, what you see are clouds, and they almost look like waves or like shark fins. But that what's happening there is warm air is rising over that island, and then there's wind aloft that's blowing the tops off the, uh, the clouds. And so it makes it look like shark fins or waves. Really spectacular. Next slide. And unfortunately, one of the hardest parts is that we have to leave when we're out and we leave the islands. Here are two, this is another species of boobies. These are called Nazca boobies. And, you know, sometimes I think the animals like having us visit just as much as we like visiting them. So with that, I am going to turn it back over, but I'll be available for questions and to answer some questions. So there you go. That's good. You know, Gil, could I ask you one question sure. now before you, before you um, leave us? Um, what would you say to someone who was contemplating going to the Galapagos would be um, a takeaway that they would have from, from this amazing experience? Um, I'm going to give you two answers. <laughs> One is how we can live and coexist with nature more peacefully. Um, I, I think you, you come away recognizing that we actually can live in a way where you can see nature, you can be part of it. Um, and then the other thing I hope, people come away respecting nature and wanting to do better about how we treat the planet with regard to pollution and climate change, all of that. I think I think you come away with just so much respect and and just a connection that you don't have beforehand. And, you, and I hope people wanna do better. 
You know, I totally agree with you. And I just want to say that the group that I was with, we did not know each other when we started. We are all fast friends now. We've kept in touch with each other over the years because when you experience that, it's almost like being in a wonderland, a wonderland that you wish a Garden of Eden that the rest of the world was and we could get back to in some way because it's uh, it I, just stepping over sea lions as you're walking along the beach and having them look up at you and just go, uh, you know, it, <laughs> there's something just so, so enchanting about being in a place where um, where they're just free to be who they are and, and no predators. You it know? is. And and I think it's an experience that, you know, that's sort of cliche to say it lasts a lifetime, mm -hmm. but it really does. It has yeah. that kind of impact on you. Every, and, you know, I yeah. hear that all the time. Yeah, there's no question. And actually, we talked about it and we're all we're all about the same age. And we felt like we were going back to camp in a way, even though we were in a beautiful environment and the ship was gorgeous. The fact is we were putting on wetsuits every day and we were snorkeling and we felt like kids, you know, going down to the, to the wet room and putting on our, our stuff. And uh, I mean, I hadn't had that kind of just total freedom and fun since I'd been to camp as a kid. Oh, I, I, I believe it. I never get sick of going. I I. And just as excited every time I go. That's great. Well, I mean, Ellen, we we just so appreciated you giving us that glimpse of uh, of what to expect in the Galapagos. And uh, thank you for being with us. You will be coming back um, yep. in roughly 15 minutes or so um, after we have our our next guest, who is going to come on and tell us about now. How do you do this? What's it like, you know, to actually cruise in, in the Galapagos? And uh, what is celebrity doing to maintain this ecosystem in a way that is going to keep it around for forever? <laughs> so thank you very much for being with Great. us. So I'm going to introduce Susanna Romano, who is with Celebrity Cruise Line. She's the director of Galapagos Sales and Communications at Celebrity. I heard Susanna speak at a conference earlier this year, it was in February, and I have to say that she is infectiously enthusiastic about the Galapagos Islands. She has been with Celebrity Cruises since, nine, since uh, 2006, and during that time has made the rounds from product development to new build to new product launches and has become an expert in her own right on the Galapagos. Celebrity has been doing these cruises since 2003, and Susanna has been alongside at their hip every step of the way, and really can be credited for um, helping to create this experience. So welcome, Susanna. Thank you. So glad to be here today. <laughs> so I guess the, the first question that I would have for you is, um, you know, you've been involved now for a while, for 17 years. Um, and since you've been there for the beginning, you know, can you tell us a little bit about um, celebrities' commitment and and why you you believe in your heart, you know, that this is the best way for us to preserve these islands is to experience them. Oh, Joyce, thank you so much. That's a great question. As a matter of fact, coming after my favorite scientist, the prettiest one I know, the one that can make science feel so amazingly great, it's not easy. So I'm going to give it a try. Okay, um, great. We're going to load your slides right now. Thank you. And and I got to tell you that, that most of the science that I know um, Ellen has been my mentor when it comes to the science side of, of what I do, right? And I do know in my heart that Celebrity does it better than anyone else because as a company, not only as Celebrity Cruises, but as part of Royal Caribbean Group, our commitment to the environment and our commitment to the communities that we serve is unparalleled. And through the conversation today, um, you will see why and you will see how and you will see how important this is to us. It, it's as important as as providing the best Galapagos experience on board our vessels, but also what we're doing it while maintaining the smallest environmental impact. Mm -hmm. Like you said, we actually bought uh, the first company in 2003. Uh, navigating in these areas is, is quite difficult. It is so highly regulated as it should be. And we came to uh, Ecuador um, to look at the possibility of offering Galapagos uh, voyages back in 2003. Uh, back then, Dr. Prager, Ellen, my friend, um, was part of that initial group um, that at the time uh, put together the environmental uh, positioning for us. And our chairman, 
um, Richard Fain decided at the time that it was the right thing to do. Um, like I said, it is about identifying and, and supporting the efforts that these communities need, um, again, while maintaining the smallest environmental impact to these islands. As we move forward um, with these slides, um, Joyce, and if you have any questions, please interrupt me. I'm, I'm fully used to it, right? No, no, no issues here. Um, but I wanted to kind of bring up some of the things that are truly important to us uh, and when it comes to stewardship and social responsibility. Um, having a ship in a destination like this is, is actually uh, uh, humbling. Um, we are privileged to have this honor and, and these islands uh, truly deserve that we uh, not only spend the time, but we also get to know its communities and what to do there. Um, we, we go the full gamut from um, environmentally safe and sustainable uh, food sources. And we'll talk a little bit about that and how we have helped the communities um, create co-ops. And we even have a tomato uh, that has been named after us because we work very closely with the communities. Um, we do renovation in the community. We, do, we work with the communities to renovate soccer fields because this happens to be what the community wants because it's not what we want, it's what they want and what's important to them. Um, we support conservation leaders. We do work with young leaders that want to do research. And through the, the, our relationship with the World Wildlife Fund, we support all of this research with this young um, naturalist. And we have guest on participation. And I love the program that we do there. We have the first and only Galapagos National Park sponsored reforestation program. This is a program where our guests actually get to plant trees. And to date, we have planted more than 50,000 trees for the Scalicia reforestation. That's amazing. And I understand you brought a short video to share with us about that. Every tree is tagged. It belongs to the guest. Um, it is an amazing experience. Um, celebrity um, purchases all of the trees and our guests get to actually plant it and be part of this process. We talked about all of these different initiatives and, and what's important to me is that our guests uh, and, and those leaders that are helping people make decisions about how to go to Galapagos, understand that we have an amazing fleet of vessels. Um, what started in 2003 with the introduction of Celebrity Expedition, which was our iconic first vessel, which by the way, was industry leading at the time. We brought sustainable luxury travel to the Galapagos Islands in 2004 to the culmination, which has been the introduction of the very first purpose-built vessel um, for the Galapagos Islands. And could you also mention, uh, Susanna, the size of these? Because I've already seen one question that's coming through about, um, you know, what is it like size-wise? How, how big will the groups be that I'm traveling with? So as you mentioned your vessels, mention the size, because that's very important. Absolutely. Um, Celebrity Expedition, which is the one to the far left, um, which is the ship that started our relationship in Galapagos, was originally a 100 passenger vessel, now only 48. So this vessel went from being 100 to 48 to think about the amount of space uh, that we have not only on board, but when it comes to going ashore, our guests will be going ashore in groups of no more than 10. Um, it could be eight, to 10. The Galapagos National Park requires that the groups be up to 16 guests. Uh, we're keeping our groups between 8 to 10 because we think that is the right number. Uh, to the far right, we have um, Celebrity Exploration, and this is an amazing catamaran. It's only 16 guests, and this catamaran is for families, for 
private meetings for that chief uh, um, officer uh, from a small company that wants to have a very covert meeting somewhere and at the same time have a very in-depth experience. This is for a true traveler, only 16 guests. And then the hero, the latest, um, uh, the one that has the most technology uh, and truly incredible celebrity flora. Mm -hmm. And the celebrity flora, I understand, was created, built specifically for the Galapagos. Joyce, we spent more than a year sitting in meetings talking about how this ship needed to not only look and feel, but what it needed to do for these islands. And I was very lucky to be part of that group with engineers, with the architects. I, I, I tell you, I, I used to pinch myself and say, am I really part of this team? And, and I truly appreciate the trust that it was put in the team because they truly listen. And I remember Francesca Bucci, which is um, the amazing lady that did the interior design for this vessel, for her to understand that we had to design a vessel that was complementary to the destination. This wasn't about building a luxury ship and plopping it into a destination. It was about building a ship that had harmony. I remember conversations about when I would say, the staterooms, the suites, this is an old suite vessel, must be a refuge. And she would say to me, what do you mean by that? And I'd say, Francesca, the experiences are so strong. They're so vivid that when you come from shore and you just had these amazing encounters, truly life-changing feelings, you need to go to a place where you can kind of take it all in, when you can feel like in a sanctuary, in a place that has an amazing bathroom, that I can take a great shower, that I can sit and, and jog on my journal what I just felt, sit in my balcony, and then go meet the rest of my guests in the amazing public areas that do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's very, uh, you mentioned some of the sustainable um, uh, practices on the ship. I mean, just you have them listed here if anybody that wants to read them, but this is this is quite amazing what you've done here. Oh, it, this ship has every bell and whistle that, that the big vessels um, have because they have uh, the space for technology and we were able to actually design it with all of them. And I can mention a few that I think are truly cool. Uh, dynamic positioning allows us to be in position in the islands without having to drop anchor. Uh, we not only use um, satellite positioning, but we also use our thrusters and our ships are able to stay in position. These ships have the first and only zero speed stabilizers. These vessels use um, air conditioning, water condensation for um, to do laundry. We have reverse osmosis programs where we're able to create our own water. And, and truly important to all of us because we are zero plastic. We did not want to have plastic in this environment. Not only is a mandate, but it is the right thing to do. Every suite has its own in-suite water filtration system. So you're able to refill your water bottles. I happen to have mine from Flora here. We provide every guest with one of these uh, bottles for them to actually have drinking filtered water in their rooms. We have solar panels to actually help us with our emissions. We have opportunities for all kinds of different things. We have opportunities for our guests to match donations um, to the fund that actually provides programs for the island. So I can go on and on and on for two days. <laughs> well, I think the, the next uh, best thing we could do is show a little video. Yes, maybe a the short case. video with your president, our friend, Lisa Lutar Pro. Oh, amazing <laughs> video. Please, please, please. Celebrity Flora is a life-changing experience. This is the first ship ever built for the Galapagos. It really, for me, is the thing about this ship that is so special in terms of how it enables our guests to relate to this beautiful environment. We are business here. It is a pristine environment that so many people care about preserving. For as long as we are here in the Galapagos, we are going to continue to work to strengthen our partnership with the community, the experience for our guests, and we are going to bring as much information and education to our guests to not only preserve this beautiful environment, but the environment in all of the places in the world so that we can all continue to enjoy this planet for many, many years to come.
Remarkable. I am so ready to go back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me as well. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to put a little plug in there for female leadership. You know, I know that Lisa is doing an amazing job, you know, heading up your company in, uh, in the sustainability side because it's very important to her. It's in her heart as well. So um, you know, really great that you have her as your leader. Truly is. I couldn't be more proud. <laughs> That's great. I know partnerships are truly important um, in the world. Uh, you know, it, it's not about who you are, but it's also about the company that you keep, right? And I am, I am very proud, and I can, I can kind of share a few thoughts about some of the partners that we have. Obviously, the Galapagos National Park, our number one partner. Um, all of our guides are um, certified by the Galapagos National Park. Uh, but we also have incredible programs like our reforestation program um, with the park. Um, Earth Echo, and, and if you're about my age, um, you probably grew up seeing um, Jacques Cousteau, which to me is, is the founder, the, 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 the one guy that brought um, the idea of conservation and preservation of the oceans to life. I remember watching TV, black and white. Um, I grew up in Spain, and he had his little beanie cap and was in his Zodiac and was always talking to us um, children at the time about preservation and conservation fast forward through his family today his grandson um, Philippe Cousteau Jr. Um, heads an organization called Earth Echo and we partner with them uh, their main um, objective is to empower the youth and to teach the youth about conservation and preservation of, of their communities and and the waters that surround their communities never more important than in Galapagos um, Philip and Patricia Frost, the Museum of Science, we've partnered with them for great, fun educational programs, uh, kind of TED Talk-like um, educational videos that we feature uh, on our ships. You met Dr. Prager. Uh, I cannot be more um, humble and, and happy that, that she is part of our family and that she's been with us um, through this journey. Sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes being hard on us and telling us, you know, you got to do it different and you got to listen to me. And we truly appreciate it when she does that. Um, our gut mother. And, and I know that I don't, I don't want to give too much away because I know that we've got um, a video coming up about her. But she is truly inspirational, uh, an incredible environmentalist. And you learn a little bit more about who she is later. Um, but before we get there, also super important to us is, is science. And how can we be better to the science world, right? So we've partnered with the University of Miami Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric um, Science. That's a mouthful, right? It's like the Rasmus Group. And mm -hmm. we currently have um, equipment on board um, our vessels, many of our fleet um, throughout the world, but specifically in Galapagos. And I'll show you on the next slide Kind of to give you an idea of what we do, we have equipment on board Flora that actually collects and shares information free of charge with the scientific world. As um, Ellen said earlier, it's not only about the animals. The truth is that um, the current in Galapagos, the water, is is the the hero. Is what's responsible for for how these nutrients are, are come about and how these islands thrive. So we are collecting um, data. We're collecting, you know, meteorological variables and water temperature and, and pressure and carbon dioxide. And it, it all sounds so geeky, but it is amazing that we're able to do this and share it with um, the international community, again, free of charge um, uh, for their studies. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Susanna, you mentioned um, the your godmother a little bit earlier, and we're about to go into a short video on about your godmother, and she is world-renowned conservationist Yolanda Kakabatsi. And right. I had the great pleasure of hearing her speak when I was in Ecuador a number of years ago at a conference, and, and she truly is remarkable. So um, you know, kudos to you for having her be your godmother. So why don't we just go to that? That's a good, a quick two-minute video. And then after that, uh, we're going to go into questions and answers. So if you haven't asked great. your question yet, and I can see them mounting, which is great, uh, go ahead and, and ask that question below, and we're prepared to answer all of them. Thank you. Jolanda is amazing. You'll get to see that. Thank 
to run. doing something. I had never known that that uh, you could be a godmother of a ship. This is going to be a, a path that we walk together, an in interesting uh, opportunity and uh, challenge. Okay, that was a really nice way to end. <laughs> yes, and I'm going to tell you one more tidbit about her. The president of Ecuador has just asked her to join a very small elite group of people um, to help with the reactivation of um, the Galapagos Islands after this pandemic when it, from a tourism um, and economic standpoint. So this lady is remarkable. So you couldn't have a better godmother and someone working directly with you. That's mm -hmm. tremendous. Yeah. Well, congratulations to Yolanda. Thank you. She, she deserves every bit of her success and all the work that she's done around the globe. What we'd like to do now is uh, is bring Ellen back on uh, on the program, and uh, and and she there she is. Yes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you were hiding back there. I can see you. <laughs> So welcome back. Uh, we do have a number of questions, and uh, you know, I actually saw one float by on the on the chat, which I'm going to throw out there because we talked about the size of two of your vessels, Susanna. But we got we didn't actually say the size of the flora. How big is the flora? How many suites do you have on your all suite vessel? We have 50 suites, 100 passengers, which is the maximum capacity allowed by the Galapagos National Park. That's that answered someone else's question also. So you just hit two and one. Very very good. <laughs> Um, so, so here's one um, about the um, the islands themselves, and probably you would like this one, Ellen. Which is, you know, are people allowed to live on the islands? Yes, only outside of the park. There are several main towns, and you'd be surprised. The population is probably today greater than thirty thousand people living in the Galapagos. Two towns mainly, one on San Cristobal and one on Santa Cruz but they're not allowed to actually live within the park itself. So those outer islands and any place that's designated as park, you can't have people live in. Well, that actually kind of dovetails with a question that, uh, that I think is, is, is a good one. For people who are geographically challenged, where in the world are the Galapagos Islands and how do you get there? I'll take that. <laughs> um, the Galapagos are on the Pacific Ocean. So if you are in North America, you would fly to South America to Quito, Quito being um, the capital of Ecuador, and then um, continue on on at least the next day, if not a couple of days after, um, 650 miles off the coast of Ecuador in the middle of the Pacific. So if you look at a map and you kind of see Mexico and then keep on going down and there is the Panama Canal and we have the Pacific and um, the Atlantic, the islands are on the Pacific coast. Um, perspective, um, a flight from Miami is about three hours and 45 minutes uh, to Quito um, from uh, um, Houston, a little bit more, but straight down. 
And then there is an hour and 45 minute flight from mainland Ecuador into uh, the Galapagos Islands. Okay. So is this why, because they're so far offshore, um, why they're so deep? Because the water is cold and they're deep. And, and when you're snorkeling, you can actually look off the shelf and see very, well, you can't see. It goes dark down there. You know, and that's why the species, they have so much rich abundance of fish is what I had heard. So um, is this why? Oh, that's a question. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So a couple things. One of the cool things about the Galapagos Islands is they straddle the equator. So you can actually go to the north and south, north of the equator and south of the equator in a, in a single cruise several times, which is kind of fun. But the reason there's so much abundance there principally is because there's an underwater current that goes from the, um, from say Australia, the west part of the Pacific to the east part. It strikes the base of the Galapagos Islands, the base of the volcanic islands, and that causes up what's called upwelling. So you get cold, deep, nutrient-rich water that wells up towards the surface, and it acts like fertilizer. And so you get plankton blooming, and that plankton is the base of a food chain that then blossoms. So then you get fish, you get birds eating the fish, you get bigger species eating the other fish. And so it's, it's that upwelling of nutrient-rich water around the islands that creates the abundance that we find in the Galapagos. And luckily and they're so well fed, they don't want you because it was the only place I'd ever been that I was in the water with hammerhead sharks. Now they were below me, you know, but we were just casually cruising on top of them. And I don't think I ever would have dared to do that any place else. Yeah, no, people aren't good shark food, but it's not something you have to worry about there. I mean, I always tell people we taste terrible. People, you know, <laughs> sharks don't go after people for food. But um, yeah, you don't have to, we snorkel with sharks all the time there and, or dive with them. And it's really, it's I, not I, an issue. I actually always say that the Galapagos is the only place in the world where I have been that when someone yells shark, people come. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, so how many visitors are allowed in the Galapagos on any given day? The daily visitor count fluctuates because you have visitors that are coming via permits uh, for the tour operators like the ships. But you also have people that are coming in to stay in some of the main islands that um, Ellen mentioned, um, Santa Cruz in Puerto Ayora, which is outside of the park, which, by the way, Ellen, keep, uh, Ellen, keep me honest. I think it's 97 percent of the archipelago is a national park. So there's a very small area. Um, of the actual uh, um, archipelago that's allowed for uh, for people to live in them. Uh, mostly, again, in Puerto Ayora, in the island of Santa Cruz, then Cristobal, and then a little bit in, in um, some of, of the other islands around, but very small towns. So you have people that are coming in um, to stay in these islands, in hotels. You have family. But overall, I believe the number of tourists that... Uh, actually visited the islands was about 250,000 last year, a little bit under 250,000 last year. Okay. Well, so here's a question about the um, animal life. Uh, what species are most threatened in the Galapagos? Well, you know, what I would say is there's not an individual species, I would say, that's threatened, but the ecosystem is threatened by things like invasive species and climate change. So mm. it's the entire ecosystem that we worry about. Things, you know, invasive species, they have problems with, humans have brought goats, rats, feral cats and dogs, even donkeys are on the island and are causing trouble. So um, that that's a, a, a really big problem and the park is working very hard with the naturalists. We work with them to try and eradicate invasive species and to uh, reduce the, the impacts um, one of the species that there's not a ton of them that is under threat is are the penguins. There's a small population of the Galapagos penguins. They are the second smallest penguins in the world, and they're found the furthest north in the world. They're really cute, um, but there's not a huge population of them. So that the park is actually working to help try and drive the numbers up of the penguins. Yeah, and, and I wanted to add, Ellen, and I, I always found it interesting, you know, how do I, how do I put in perspective these, these animals that have been introduced? And when you think about historically what, what we do when we colonize, when we go into a new area and we want to, that area to grow, what do we do? We bring the things that we had where we come from that were of comfort to us. So, for example, the, the, the example that you gave about the goats, 
it made a lot of sense for um, these people that came from Europe, we know where they came from, to bring goats because they all of a sudden had milk, they had cheese, and they had meat, right? What they didn't think about was the impact that these animals would have because goats eat anything and everything in sight. So as they ate their way through the islands, they also ate the food source for the land herders. So what happened? What happened is that we began to see that correlation between what happens when you disrupt the environment by introducing species. And I know that the park has done an amazing job uh, in trying to eradicate the goats to bring those populations back. So actually, this is the, one of my observations, is that um, the islands are actually in better shape today than they were, say, in the 70s uh, and earlier because of the people who are coming as tourists. With sustained tourism, those islands have an ability to, um, to, to kind of keep that in check, you know, so that people aren't just arbitrarily bringing in species that shouldn't be there because it is a national park and it's highly, highly regulated. And that wasn't necessarily the, the case many years ago. So, um, so that, I think that, that, that what you're doing is actually preserving that going forward. It's, it's really important. And I think sometimes people misunderstand tourism and the impacts in the islands. Without tourism, the country would not have the incentive to protect those islands and keep them as pristine as they do. And it's, so it's incredibly important. And I have to give credit to the naturalist system. One of the ways they protect those islands very well is that you're not allowed to, nobody is allowed to go on those islands without a, a licensed naturalist. Mm -hmm. And part of that naturalist job is to make sure everybody stays on the trailers. You can't go off the trails. There's no food brought on. There's no trash. If they see somebody on the islands who's not supposed to be it, they have to report it. That's part of their job. And so that system, that naturalist system, and the way all of the tourists, you know, celebrity and other operators work with those naturalists is one of the things that protects the islands and why they are in such good shape. Without mm -hmm. a doubt. Well, that actually is another question on here. It fits perfectly. Um, understanding that the max capacity for the vessels is 100, but how many ships at a time are there? I'm recalling I never saw another vessel, but I think only one at, at a time, right, in an island? Actually, in many of the islands that we go to in our itineraries, we are the only vessel there, especially with, with uh, Celebrity Flora, which is our 100-passenger vessel. I haven't seen any other vessel other than a tiny little vessel that may have um, six people. The park works very, very carefully when they are actually providing our itineraries, which they do and they look at every, every year, uh, once a year. The park now gives us 14-day rotations. And they do this to um, actually minimize the amount of times that we go to the same location. So it's a very carefully curated dance in the way that they do it to do that. Ellen. Yeah, I was just going to add, there's actually quite a few ships operating in the Galapagos, but you don't see them because just as Susanna says, we work very closely with the park so that when we're somewhere, you don't see all those other ships. So again, mm -hmm. that is one of the ways, again, they're protecting not only the park, but they're protecting the guest experience as well. Well, it's also a reason to go back more than once because I realized that as many islands as we saw, there are more and there are more. So there is enough, uh, I think, disbursement of, uh, of the ships to be going to different places. And each one has their own different feel and different species. And I, that's what I found fascinating. Like you're not gonna see the tortoises on every island. You'll see it in a place. And then you're not gonna see the boobies everywhere. So it's like every place you go, there's a specific species that is uh, like the cornerstone to that island. Yeah. Yeah, the, the islands, um, depending, a lot of it has to do with how old the islands are and where they are. The old, think of it this way, the oldest islands, and I'm not going to go into the science of how the islands are created with the hotspot and the plates move, but. <laughs> I love but, that story. <laughs> <laughs> but the islands that are farthest away from where they originated, the hotspot in the Galapagos, they're the oldest and they're the densest packed with wildlife because over time, You've had time for the vegetation to grow, for everything to take hold, and for different species to come in. And so one of the things I think is so fascinating that you can see in the Galapagos is you go to an, an older island. You can't even tell it was a volcano at one time. You see all these animals. And then two days later, you go to an island that looks like the volcano just erupted yesterday. Yeah. There's hardly any animals, but there's cool lava and some initial animals coming in. 
And you can actually see that and understand that whole sort of evolution of islands and how they the animals grow on them. It's it's really it's pretty so exciting. true, Ellen. So true. When I I remember the first time I landed on Fernandina Island and I saw these lava fields, right? And I believe and correct me if I'm wrong that Fernandina is one of the youngest in geological years in Galapagos, and you see these lava fields that look like they just cooled off yesterday. They have the ripples, they, it, it's all there. And then you turn around and you say, and the animals that live here, where are they finding food? <laughs> this was my biggest question, right? I see all of these iguanas and guess what? These are the iguanas that actually go underwater to, yep. to actually graze and feed from what they find. Um, undersea, so it is. It is. It is a living laboratory that we all get to put our hands in and truly experience. Yeah. Uh, for people who are curious, I they can't miss this destination. You you have to have to go here. So I'm going to do have one more question here. Um, you know, which is tell us a little bit. And I guess this would be to to you, um, Susanna. Is the exploration your smallest vessel only available for charter for 16 people, or could a couple go and just be in a much smaller environment? Oh, absolutely. We are open for sale um, for individuals. If people that enjoy that truly small environment and like to be really close to the water and understand that sailing in a catamaran is a very different experience than sailing on, on expedition or even on flora, right? Uh, just the sheer size changes how it moves, how it sails. Uh, but truly, it is certainly available for um, just a couple that wants to go share with, uh, you know, seven other couples and be on that vessel. Yeah, so, actually, uh, go ahead. I know. I was just going to say maybe just so that your your listeners understand, your viewers understand. Um, just because you're on a bigger ship, when you go on the island, you're still going to be with a small group. So, because people have that concern, oh, I want to be on a small ship, but the small ship go out on the islands with the exact same numbers essentially that you do from the bigger ships. Mm -hmm. Actually, actually, in in reality, and and the bigger vessels have bigger zodiacs which are more comfortable and allow for better movement so you know there is give and take if you really want to be that close right. to the water and and kind of be looking at the captain throwing the anchor maybe by himself then exploration is great for you if you're looking for um midway 48 guests expedition has every bell and whistle if you want mm -hmm. a long luxury um experience flora is for you yeah, I think also on the little bit larger, um, maybe more naturalists and more speakers. And you know, I'm sure you have a program on all of them. But, um, you know, I do find that might be a little bit more variety for people who, you know, want to have that to go on a slightly larger Entertainment. Vessel. Yeah. Music, say, dancing. <laughs> regardless of what size of your vessel that you go on, you can't miss going out on deck at night and seeing those stars. Oh. I have never in my life seen stars. Even long ago when I went to the Himalayas and I was at the top of the world, I didn't see stars like that. It's so far out in the ocean with no light pollution. Um, it, it's just as though they're falling around you. It's incredible. Joyce, can I tell you a story about that? <laughs> a, you know, the park actually regulates even uh, the type of lights that we use at night and which ones we can have on and off. And they have to be a certain color and a certain warmth so it doesn't disrupt the animals, not only on the water, but what's flying. So we have created an experience on Flora where our guests get to do an overnight glamping experience. We have cabanas <laughs> up, up on deck. And I know it's amazing. And um, we serve a, a highly curated uh, camp inspired dinner. We do a private stargazing opportunity and people actually get to sleep outside um, for the night and, and have that, that experience that's actually not even allowed in the park, right? Because you can't overnight uh, in the destination. So truly, truly quite different and distinct. That is a really great place to end. And I wanna thank both of you for making this enjoyable, making it fun and, um, you know, and, and interesting, you know, and uh, absolutely everything that that I knew about both of you is is true, that you bring this destination alive and, and you're the right people to be talking about it and just uh, your knowledge and experience. And we really are honored to have you today. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's our Thank pleasure. You. So as, as our guests exit, 
I wanted to mention that if you miss any of this program, that you will, if you if you are here now, that you will get a recording because this is all recorded and it will be sent to you in an email. If you'd like to see any of our other programs in the series, you can go to sustainableships.com and you can click on our, our live cast series and you'll see that. Our past programs, um, you know, are in various areas of the world and various types of destinations. So, I mean, please do take a look at that and see if there's anything else that you could you find of interest to you. Be sure to register for this year's Sea Trade Virtual Conference, the first one ever. It's October 5 to 8, and uh, I've been invited to be on their sustainability panel with some uh, pretty good experts in the area of sustainability in the world, uh, and specifically in the cruise industry. And stay tuned for future program announcements and who we'll have as our next guest. And you know, stay on our mailing list, post on social media, and uh, and stay in touch. So thank you all for being with us today, and. Live sustainably.